live again. Let's uh, get our little show on the road here. Our little pretty clack. Welcome to Earth on this day, the 26th of May, 2021. As the typewriters and analysts and such like glide by the advert for Troublesome Paradise Methodology of Creationism Project or ToconWordPress.com. Loads of stuff there to download freebie, share it widely, freely. That's what it's there for. Okay. I do not know if Jackson is going to be joining the show. He um, um, hasn't yet responded to the thing. Some things that may have come up from his end, and I hope all is well in there. Uh, at any rate, we will carry on. Oh, hi, I am seeing the old, uh, the live chat. Hi, Lisa. So that at least, that does not always materialize, by the way. And so I'm always delighted when the, uh, the live chat actually occurs. So um, whether or not Jackson shows up, uh, we will say hi to Jackson. Um, we will be alluding to Jackson as well, because he was just on Prophet of Zod's uh, channel, uh, offering some evolution material, which I was just looking through today. Uh, it's uh, uh, Zod was diving into a rather superficial creationist pastor who was repeating a really big pile of claptrap, and I'll get a lot of that anyway. Along the way, uh, Jackson was uh, being brought on to discuss evolution. I only got about halfway through the thing, so I have not actually got to the part where Jackson has shown up. So I was going to ask him uh, if he wanted to give a spoiler alert on his presentation in there. But anyway, I'll be including a link on uh, the Prophet of Zod video and get, um, in the uh, finished thing once we're all posting up. Anyway, as usual, we are continuing the source methods on the fly, analyzing Nathaniel Jensen's replacing Darwin, the new origin of species, which ain't all that new. And also ain't much of a rival for um, uh, the actual scientific world. And so what the whole point of this long exercise and previously the uh, uh, analysis of Rupin Sanford's uh, Contested Bones book is that um, source methods is the seat of the pants core of how you go about analyzing um, any project. It's not magic. It's not rocket science. It's basic argumentation and evidence. If you make a claim, um, do you offer sources for it? Do the sources say what you want them to say? If not, uh-oh, we got problems. Uh, if we're dealing with topics that have um, a scholarly literature available to them, how well has their argument fared? Are they ignoring criticisms of their work and so forth and so on? And uh, all of that becomes glaringly obvious at the source level where you find over and over again, people misrepresent material. Um, oh, getting that, Brian Stevens says, whether a theist or an atheist, uh, uh, just a person calls no vengeance upon himself. I, I like to avoid the vengeance thing. Uh, some of the gods are supposedly quite vengeful. Others are quite indifferent. Um, we can leave that to them. If any of them exist, they're perfectly capable of doing what it is they want, like um, uh, the god Apollo in the old Star Trek episode until they found out that he was just an alien that had a power pack and they pulled the plug on him and whoop, that was the end of Apollo. Whoops. Um, or Star Trek V, uh, the motion picture there where um, Captain Kirk wonders, why does God need a starship? Hmm. Anyway, uh, back to the, uh, the point at issue, which is scholarly methods and uh, Nathaniel Jensen's book. So we're going to be dealing with... Um, uh, some more of his stuff on mitochondria. This whole chapter that he's uh, delving into is trying to argue that mitochondrial DNA evidence somehow supports a young Earth model. And I'm waiting for him to get to the let's test and detail phase. But before we get to that, uh, let me um, definitely thank our patrons, just in case there's a screw up with the uh, feed. I always like to get that out of the way these days because sometimes... YouTube can be a mess, especially if some important event suddenly occurs and suddenly everybody's on the internet and it screws up the connection. So um, I will thank our colleague level, Henry Colton, Eric Rowley, Suris, and Zeshi, uh, Travis Adams, uh, Ian Chen at research level, Convert Me, Stephen Early, Eaton Neal, James Fitzwater, History Minor, Ralph McFadden, Apologia, Benjamin Simpson, Speed of Sound, Studio, DM Wing, 
Our assistant researchers, Kamam Cyborg, Doranku Jelly, Totus Real, and Christopher Johnson. Our friends, Steve Bauman, Mary Gail Beddows, Daniel, Insects Cool, Morton Nielsen, Paul the Skeptic, Papalophagus, Bo Rasmussen, Evan Reeves, Alex Jones, and Paul Williams. And I will continue to thank the legacy patrons who were able to help out one or another. Uh, Jen, Jody, Mike, John, Keith, Andrew Dyer, Yui, Mona, Brad, Daniel, Nanya, Stagel, Sun Sky Stone, Ugly German Truths, Everett, Insan, Sensua, Weisbaum. So um, uh, every one of you has helped um, keep the, the grist of the machine going so I can simultaneously deal with food and bills and ink and such like and paper and all the little things that a scholar needs to deal with in order to keep the project up. So we have a question uh, from uh, Lisa. What do you think of Hovind's ridiculous breach dam for the Grand Canyon? Ah, how coincidental. That is a, a topic that relates to um, the formation of the Grand Canyon issue, which we alluded to a bit in The Rocks Were There, Volume 1, and we'll be going into in much greater detail in The Rocks Were There, Volume 2. The, it ain't Ken Hovind's idea. Hovind has not had an original thought in his mind all the years I've been studying him. So remove that from the table. No, no, no. He is repeating stuff that he has imbibed from other creationists and um, relatively superficial. Um, you have a problem with the formation of the Grand Canyon from a creationist perspective. Here's the backstory. You can think, okay, there's all these layers and layers of rock that's made by the flood, see? And then there's the canyon in it. Well, that's made by the flood. Wait a minute. How do you make a flood in a canyon? Canyon from a flood that carves through layers that are laid down by the same flood. When did they get to be rock? You know, if you take a hose to mud, it just blinks a blob. It doesn't make steep walled canyons or V shaped nested in size canyons. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, so, how do they get around it? Well, they've got to separate the dynamics. So the scenario that crystallized in young earth creationism in the 80s and 90s, uh, is the one that Kent Hovind from a mile away is basically channeling. And that is that the flood comes along and lays down all the rock, basically from the Cambrian up to the top of the canyon, which is Jurassic on the south rim and um, uh, start, or Cretaceous on the south rim and starting to move into Jurassic on the North Rim, which is about a thousand feet higher, into both sides of the Grand Canyon. And that, con that continues in the Morrison Formation all the way up into Utah and all that, Bryce Canyon and, and all that other stuff. The whole Columbia or Colorado Plateau is on a gradual rise angling around. So you're up at many thousands of feet altitude at that point. Why there's an entire canyon there. But anyway, their model is that it lays down all this rock, lickety split, somehow turns into rock, lickety split. We're talking days, 100 days, they're exceptionally vague on the fiddly bit details here. And then after it's turned into rock that you can carve a canyon through, the water that has settled in the post-flood period into a hypothetical lake upstream, then breaches conveniently enough and makes a nice catastrophic flood that actually carves canyon. Well, now they got a problem because, well, they've already got problems, but the difficulty is the amount of water required. What this rift off of is that the, the Colorado River has gone through many perturbations, especially as, and pre-Colorado River, different drainage systems before the Colorado Plateau was formed. And there's still debate to this day whether little teeny fragments of what we see exposed in the Grand Canyon reflect paleo canyons that predate the big one and that have gotten incorporated into the canyon as the final Colorado River course cuts the actual one that we're familiar with with most of the wiggly bits. Now, in the course of that discussion of how the drainage systems have altered, there was an argument that there might have been an other massive lake that's yeah, probably smaller than Glacial Lake Bonneville that was upstream to the east of the Grand Canyon area. That was hypothesized for a while. Lately, the research has suggested, nah, no, there wasn't any such lake there. They can't find any documentation for the bloody thing. So that just pulled the rug out from underneath Kent's argument. Had he been close enough to the data field to know what the issues were on all of this. Anyway, any lake that you would have had upstream would at most have produced what 
flooding we see from the Missoula floods when definite lakes break up, the, the big ones in the Lake Missoula. And this is not unique. There's glacial lakes all around the, the melting glaciers at the end of the Ice Age, and they form these catastrophic canyon bits. Uh, but they don't make V-shaped canyons. They make straight-walled canyons. They carve things down to bedrock because you have a huge amount of water moving at really big speed, hundreds of feet deep, 500 feet in the case of the Missoula floods, moving at, what, faster than an express train? Um, a, a fantastically rapid water flow that is unmistakable in the geologic record. It ain't going to form the Grand Canyon. And uh, it certainly is not enough to generate, which has to take place over a low period of time. Um, the thing about the Grand Canyon, and we went into this in great detail, in, the rocks were there, so we, we laid the foundations for it there, is incised canyons are formed when the inlet area is shifting elevation relative to the outlet faster or as fast as the river can carve down through it. If that ain't happening, you don't get an incised canyon. If that is happening, you get an incised canyon. And the reason why you get the way it is in the Grand Canyon is because the Colorado Rift Plateau is doing the uplifting. In the case of the Mediterranean Sea, the closing off the Mediterranean Isthmus uh, at Gibraltar or the, um, uh, the Strait of Gibraltar around four or five million years ago, lowered the sea level as the Mediterranean desiccated and dried up into a series of smaller lakes and, and stuff like that, and eventually refilled in a hurry when the thing was breached and kaboom, the water level raised. When that water level dropped down in the Mediterranean, we have a test bed because there's a whole slew of little incised canyons formed from the Rhone and the Nile and all of that that were out now out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea because that's the canyon deposition layers and delta forms are occurring in the dropping sea level mode. Huge amount of geology material on this, which is almost entirely ignored by creationists and therefore is really going to be ignored by bottom feeder Kent Hovind riffing at eight miles distant uh, from the actual material. So, uh, Lisa, does that answer your question? <laughs> I have a very low opinion <clears throat> of the, the upstream lake model because a it's even falling out of favor amongst creationists and b it's really fallen out of favor in the regular geological community uh lisa for truth hogan doesn't know what an uplift is except maybe in his pants i'm not sure let's get that let's get nasty about it and even then uh, he's had kids so he presumably has gotten past that little anyway um, so that there's going to be an awful lot on the Grand Canyon, the paleoecology of the area, going into all the geology of what was going on on the whole planet during all of that period. There's going to be a lot of stuff on the big slosh chapter. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, I, I, I uh, we will put that up there um, as the confirmation that it was an adequate answer for the question. Yeah, uh, Holden is just a really fascinating character to watch. Um, he is not um, a cutting edge creationist. He's a blowhard. He's the Donald Trump of creationism, as I described him uh, back in 2017, uh, in the early years of the Trump year. It said, because temperamentally, they're very, very similar characters. They're very arrogant, Dunning Kruger ignorant, who imagine they know more than they do, and bluster and bully and are hyper confident uh, in what their arguments are. But Holvin, I've been, I've been watching him for years. I first bumped into him in the mid-1990s when he was um, basically flooding the creationist community with um, videos that he was doing, videotapes of his various lectures. And you can still find a lot of them online, although most of the older material has kind of got cribbed away. And what you mainly see is the stuff that he was doing in the 2004, 5, 6 period before he got in the slammer. And then... He resumed his happy activities after he got out of the slammer. Um, that's when he went into flowered shirt mode uh, and that, uh, and doing basically YouTube stuff because it's apparently it's not got quite enough scratch the way he had before, uh, and travel restrictions and things are more complicated today uh, to deal with. Uh, that he can't do that breakneck running amok from one church to another lecture schedule that he used to do. Uh, back in the um, 80s and 90s and early 2000s. He's never gotten, uh, he doesn't write much. Once in a while, he does a silly book that's thin, um, 
they pop around uh, in the field, but he's not a writer. He's a burbling talker. I am a talker too, but I'm also a writer and even paralogs of hog up there. Uh, so words written down with sources and coherent sentences and documentation um, rigorously worked out. That I can do. Mm, yeah, I can't, can't do that. So he uh, has had no... Um, oh, uh, Elisa says, uh, yeah, Aaron Ra is going through uh, the lies of the textbook thing. Yeah, it, anybody who plows through um, uh, Kant, and, uh, and Aaron is basically doing a source analysis on this sort of stuff. A lot of the material is very old. Remember, Kent Hovind is not a cutting edge person. If you look through the times, a lot of the quotations that you'll see from the textbooks don't even give much particulars. And that's because he siphoned the stuff off secondarily. He is the ultimate in parasitical citation in this area. Uh, once in a while, he'll give a source citation, a date, or something where you can track down. They usually give the title of the book, but that's about it. And maybe or not the authors. But the quotations themselves are snippets. Supposedly, the lies he goes on is they have the temerity to talk about um, the Cambrian explosion and not say it's for creation. Uh, they'll talk about Archaeopteryx as a transitional form between reptiles and birds, which it is. Uh, they'll discuss a variety of issues. They'll even bring up the um, uh, Ernst Haeckel matter, perhaps, in some sections, depending on whether they're biology textbooks, cosmology, uh, paleontology. He skirts all over the case. But anyway, um, Kent, um, just basically quote mongers on this subject. And so um, uh, anybody that's in R and Ra's capacity that can get hold of the original material can first notice how glaringly dated most of it will be. Um, remember, he's siphoning stuff, uh, hoping to siphoning material uh, early on in his creationism career. And he still repeats a lot of the same claptrap. Even as late as 2018, he was still dusting off that nonsense uh, that Archaeopteryx was a fraud, which in a schizoid way, other times he doesn't claim it's a fraud. He acts as if it's a perfectly normal fossil bird uh, that has no connection whatsoever to dinosaurs. Let's not look at that. Never mind the teeth, never mind the tail. Um, and um, forgets the fact that at other points he's accused the, the fossil of not being a real fossil and of being a fake. Does he pay attention? Does Kent Hoban pay attention to Kent Hoban? I'm not sure he reads his own material all that. Uh, so that, um, um, how much of the original material you could gain access to these days is tough because if he's riffing off of a textbook from the 1980s, that's like fossil, that's ancient. That, that virtually no field is drawing off material that antiquated, that it's 2021 now, thanks. Uh, we're in a new world, that we've got the plate tectonic revolution that was taking place in the 1970s, and seismic uh, mapping technology has radically advanced in the last 10 years. And so if you're, even if the quotation is not taken out of context, who cares what a textbook said back when I had just graduated from college myself. I was class of 74. Uh, so it, it's just way back in the way back part. Biological material is even more glaring. I don't care what a textbook said about the biological issues if it was written before the 1990s because of all that material on homeobox genes has arisen. If you look at how he quote mongers this stuff, the two questions to ask scholarly, and if Aaron Ra sees the video at some point or if somebody communicates with Aaron Ra about it, let him know two issues you want to deal with. One, did he come up with this nugget himself, or is he riffing off of somebody else, quote, mongering it ahead of him? Given the parasitical nature of Kent Hogan, a lot of it is not original material with him. Uh, some of it comes a lot, comes from Walt Brown. Uh, and by the way, Walt Brown's stuff. I uh, can't remember what the website and that's called, but you can Google him. Um, it's available online. He posts all of his crap. And so you can do text searches and that to ascertain to what extent um, he's just glomming on to stuff from Walt Brown. Apart from Walt Brown, then there's other areas to see whether or not they're drawing off of it. Uh, by and large, I don't encounter too many instances of where he's riffing as much off the intelligent design community apologetics, not because he would 
wouldn't have an inclination to do so because they're just as anti-evolutionist on a lot of this stuff as he is. But because um, I think probably there's a reluctance on his part to, to veer away from doctrinal purity. And the gang at the Discovery Institute are, by and large, not young Earth creationists. And so they don't buy into a lot of that. Uh, just as typically I don't see um, him invoking uh, Michael Behe a lot, which would be the case if you were more of a smorgasbord type. I use that, that smorgasbord uh, term for uh, grassroots creationists who basically scavenge around for... Um, congenial ammo and they don't really know the context of the ammo um hoven was in smorgasbord mode when i debated him because um i called him to account for his um dithering on about uh archaeopteryx and drawing in alan fiducia and authority quoting alan fiducia and i began to wonder where he was getting the authority quotes from it turned out Lock, stock, and barrel verbatim. He was copying it for a Harunaya site. The the now disgraced Islamic anti-evolutionist. So I think he's in the slammer for um, running afoul of the of the morality police there in uh, Erdogan's Turkey. <laughs> the ironies of life. Uh, at any rate, uh, oh, this is the chill stream. Uh, Brian Stevens says there are thousands of fossils with them. Once we knew what to look for, it didn't take long. Um, yeah, an awful lot. There's been um, a huge upsurge in analysis that will be filtering into the published literature over time as paleontologists reevaluate older works. Uh, in some cases, you have a, a, a fossil that's buried in a blob of matrix that they've never been able to get at because it's so delicate that they're afraid to touch it. And they can do a CAT scan on it now. Or they can take a, a fossil that was squashed in the process of deposition over millions of years to where it's like, and computer morph it back into what it would have been before it got squashed. Because these dynamics happen. There's morphometric rules and all sorts of things that can be used to apply to that. And basically have a digital reconstruction of the unsquashed fossil. Those are all technologies that didn't exist a few years ago, and and that that's revolutionizing the field. Needless to say, it's not stuff that Kent Hogan's going to be paying much attention to. So what he does, uh, <coughs> oh, I don't know that I've seen. Uh, I haven't uh, seen that one about non-stamp makers' review of Noah's Ark. Uh, Learned how nonsensical the story was. Um, that chapter in volume two of the rocks were there. The big slosh fails. The big slosh uh, goes into. Uh, that aspect of it as well. The, the Noah's Ark story is really slim. It's only a few verses in Genesis. And the idea that so many creationists just go hog wild on this and build full-scale mock-ups of what they think the Ark look like based entirely on conjecture. They're just making up stuff. The same sort of people at Answers in Genesis who will scream bloody murder over conjectural reconstructions by paleoanthropologists on Lucy, the Australopithecine, or Neanderthals, or anything else, are happy to see enormous amounts of detail um, uh, inferred about what the ark was like, and what animals were on board, and what was going on, what it comes, and, and whether they had a moon pool inside, and, and blast furnaces, or not blast furnaces, but anyway, furnaces and all of this, which is an interesting thing to do, having an open fire operation at high temperatures running inside of a wooden boat. Um, this is an interesting feature to think about. Uh, but um, we'll be going into that. We'll be going into the various Babylonian legends. There's more. Everybody knows Gilgamesh. That one pops up a lot. Gilgamesh is only the last act in a long tradition of um, floodish stories that evolved over time and largely were modified based on politics. As the new regime came in, they changed the perspective to up downgrade the old culture and upgrade the new dynasty. And that happened uh, in relation, I think, to the Atrahasis epic. And so uh, there's a lot of little fiddly bit details going on uh, on there. And we'll be giving you all a little skivvy on it. Um, and those stories, if the creationist wants to say, well, those are the pathetic copies of the true story in Genesis, read the two of them and try to find anything lofty or more moral or more detailed about the Bible story versus the versions that you find in the Babylonian tales. Good luck. No, no, no. 
um, and, uh, and, and the capper that tends to get read. Right um, I recommend everybody have a Bible if they want to read this stuff. Uh, check it out. Um, because of the story that Noah, after the flood, uh, settles in and uh, goes on a bender. Apparently, he had a drinking problem. And they didn't have AA available back in the, in the Iron Age. So he um, uh, passes out buck naked after the flood. And one of the sons comes in and sees him and goes off to tell the other siblings about it. And that is where the curse of Ham comes from. Because the one son had oh, seen daddy naked. Well, what the hell? The guy's drinking himself into a stupor, you know. I mean... Is it is it the kids' fault they got eyeballs and uh, don't pay attention to this stuff? You know, but no, it's mythological. It's weird. Um, it's um, uh, uh, crazy talk stuff. It's no more lofty or moral than we find with other materials. But anyway, uh, all of that's a, uh, a, um, a presage for what's going to be going on there. I, I have left Jensen behind, so let me get back to Jensen here because we're almost into the half hour. So. Jensen is uh, talking about human mitochondrial DNA in this particular chapter, and he cites one little paper from 2000, which was therefore 17 years old at the time he cites it, on mitochondrial genome variation and the origin of modern humans, as one among uh, many, far too many papers to list them all uh, on this mitochondrial human thing. But he contends, Jensen contends, ooh, there's a lot of controversy around it. And he conveniently cites his own work from 2013 and 2015, and I'll be putting the links into those again. I, I discussed them in earlier episodes, but they pop up again. He keeps on alluding to them. But he doesn't mention any of the detailed content of that England paper. Fortunately, there's a link to it. I'll be able to put it up for you to be able to read it. Anyway, the part that intrigued me is that um, uh, Ingman concluding, quote, compelling evidence of a human mitochondrial DNA origin in Africa. Unquote. Not Mount Ararat or the Caucasus or anywhere near that, Anatolia. Nope. Down in Africa. And it is the, um, of, uh, Lisa asked, where did he get the grapes for the wine? That's another good question. Yes. Well, maybe he had a little teeny hydroponic vineyard going inside of the ark uh, that he could just keep the, the various herbivores from lighting into and then quickly did some winemaking. Uh, we have to remember, Wine making wasn't sophisticated in the old days. The wine that you're used to, if you go down to the grocery store nowadays, in the old days, you, I'm old enough and any of us old parts can remember a time when no grocery store carried a wine department, period. This was like, what, you're going to buy a Rolls Royce along with the, that stuff in the grocery store? No, you don't go to a grocery store to buy wine unless it's like Manischewitz or, you know, some cooking sherry or something. A very the, the explosion of wine departments with varietals in there that they have to have rows of things labeling Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, that all started in the mid 1970s during the wine revolution. So I'm older than that uh, time frame. But that kind of winemaking is relatively recent. Uh, even as late as the Romans, if we were to time travel back there and take a swig of wine out of the cask, we'd probably go bleh. This isn't even rough screw tack cap container stuff. And, and that's why the Romans would um, uh, put water in it. It, uh, it was like a thicker syrup. The kind of winemaking we're used to is really a medieval development. And in some cases, some of the things are very recent. Um, the um, champagne developed only in, I think, the later 16th century. So um, um, it's been a great transformation. So whatever wine, um, a grape crap, um, uh, he was drinking, probably the most beneficial thing he could have gotten out of it was to pass out. <laughs> it probably wasn't terribly tasty. But, uh, but Lisa rightly asked, where did he get the grapes for these things? And it's like everything else. The, the, um, the dove that is sent out to grab a sign of things, and it brings back an olive branch. And that way they know that the floodwaters are abating. Where did that come from? Where did the where did olive trees are olive trees uh, flood tolerant? Are the and, and cataclysmic flood tolerant at that? The kinds that are able to bury hundreds, thousands of feet of sediment in the Grand Canyon. Remember that flood thing again? You know, no, they don't think the scenario through. They never 
are going to think this scenario through. Uh, that, that all of the data field that they need to account for, they will never be able to make it fit any more than trying to write. I I write fiction, remember, so I um uh, and I know well full well how tricky you have to be in working out a plot where there's an adventure story and you have to figure out who knows what and who has what access to what and if they didn't look this way versus this way and all the little fiddly bits of where they're going and how did they get from there and what boat did they take and all that. But all of those details matter to the plausibility of the story. And everybody that tries to tackle these tales to make movies out of them has to make up shit to fill in the parts that don't make sense and more importantly, leave out the parts where they go, we're never going to make this same make sense if we keep this in the story. Um, even as uh, Around the World in 80 Days had to leave out chunks of the book that, that you go, yeah, sure, sure, or modify it, you know, the change the whole season of the story so they didn't have to worry about an ice sledge that Mr. Mudge had. Uh, so the film version is set three months earlier than the book version was. So it's not taking place in autumn uh, and all of that kind of thing. Well. The Bible needed a better continuity editor. Let's let's be honest about it. So back back to um, uh, Nathaniel Jensen. Um, instead of actually alluding to any of the content of these many papers, he instead dumps some helpful databases, which I will also be putting the links up to. One that Ingman runs at the uh, Uppsala University that hasn't been updated since two thousand seven. So that's yeah. And the other is uh, Manus Van Oven's uh, website, PhiloTree, uh, which is at least more current. It was last updated in February of 2016. Kind of dandy. What the hell is he expecting his readers to do? Is he expecting the average creationist reader, which is his audience, to go to those websites and download the data files of the genomes that have been collected and perform their own technical analysis of this? Is this very plausible? Instead of actually discussing it, no, what, what Jensen is trying to do is wow you with hand waving, smoke and mirrors, alluding to science matters and not actually getting close enough to them so you can spot how he's removed the P from under the three card money shell. And that's the problems that we come into because others have already spotted, uh, both Jensen and Tompkins and also Sanford and others, um, play fast and loose with their data field as to mutation rates and all the rest. Now, that Ingman paper that Jensen brought up, remember, his one and only technical paper that he cites of oh, those many, 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 many papers that are far too numerous for him to allude to. And he doesn't even give you a thing. I suppose you're supposed to Google search. Anyway, I decided just to Google Scholar the Ingman paper explicitly to see what all has been done. Well, Turns out it alone has been cited by over 1,800 papers, which is way bigger than the size of his book, way bigger than the reference bibliography. So far, he has averaged about one source per page. So even though we're now in page 170 something, he's only cited about 180 sources, which is 1% or 10% of uh, the sources of just that Ingman paper. What are some of those? Well, I look down through the pages and pages and pages. These are not in chronological order and, and, and that they, they go through them. In a, I think they run by the alphabetical of the author. At any rate, uh, one uh, from uh, 2007 by Tam uh, from PLOS uh, One um, ha was involving the Beringian standstill and spread of Native American founders, which was working off of utilizing the mutation rate data that they were collecting from all these different population groups in England, among others, to analyze the migration patterns of people into the Beringia area up in the Bering Straits and then ultimately into uh, the Americas. Uh oh, isn't that a population that has to be moving? after the flood, how this is the people that have been living there since they arrived. When was that? Well, the dates in the TAM paper are from uh, commencing about 25,000 years ago. And um, uh, the Amerindians are definitely in America by about 15,000 years ago. So um, 
That's, let me see, 9,000 years before the creation of the universe, uh, according to the model that Jensen is not very clear about openly presenting, or to be charitable, 3,000 years before the 12,000 year boundary layer that he was waving at us note after note uh, that we discussed in some previous episodes. Is chronology going to be a problem for Jensen continually? Spoiler alert, yes. It's never going to go away. Um, Elisa Perdue says, that's a book. Yeah, there's some, um, let me get, let me be uh, a viciously nasty here. And um, now his is a hardcover. Mine is a paperback. Okay. And my book, mine with Jackson, I don't know, I'm going to let Jackson weed out of this. Uh, the, uh, the last page of the index is on page 827. The last page of the text, because we have a really long bibliography that runs for hundred some odd pages. Uh, the last page of the appendix and text is on page 604, right there on the genetic code. That's our little tome. His little book, which has no index, the last page of the notes on that and the acknowledgments, the picture credits, and glossary, that's the glossary, is uh, on page 335. And his main typeface style is considerably bigger than uh, our typeface style. So no, it's not a very big book. And if you remove, if you did it in just paperback form, uh, it would be thinner yet. Uh, Rupi and Sanford is in the same way. Uh, Don Sanford's um, genetic entry book is even worse. It's about physically the same size as that and even bigger typeface. And then we get down to, um, uh, you know, if you get down to your standing for truth, Matt Powell level, then you're into um, cut and paste vomit <laughs> books. <laughs> ah, well. Um, oh, Scott says, I've got rocks there uh, right next to me. Uh, yes, we, uh, we, we hope you are enjoying the work. Um, the main, there's, um, it's designed to act as a functional resource or two groups of people. One are people that don't know a great deal about the creationism issue, and this will bring them up to speed in a hurry uh, so that you'll have a huge number of the dramatis personae and the technical issues and the complaints and discussions that are being used by modern creationists, not the ones from the 1960s and 70s that Kent Hogan fossil is relying on 18th hand in his uh, lecture series. Uh, and then volume two will continue with that, filling out the other end because um, uh, we'll be having extensive sections on the origin of tetrapods uh, with Tiktaalik and it's way more than just that uh, and all the biological material there. And, it, and what we're intending to do is that it also passes muster for people who are college level up-to-date scientists so that we're not dumbing it down we're not um, you know, going at the Scientific American, Science News, Science Daily level, but instead um, referencing technical issues. And sometimes we'll have reference notes where we'll say, if you want to learn more about this, you can go in here and here's blah, 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 blah the various technical papers that, that deal with all of that. So that whatever level you're coming in at it, um, uh, um, an amateur wanting to know more about the subject or somebody in the scientific field that doesn't want to be talk down to when you need to know the specific particulars of particular genetic information and geological information and all the rest. And we, and we get our stuff with people who are um, uh, experts in their areas so that we can make sure that we don't goof up on anything and make it nice and solid. Uh, and we're, we're very careful though. And source methods, because we use proper source methods, if we're making an assertion, we're going to document it. We're going to make sure the documentation can hold up and we can defend any aspect of it. And 
a measure of it is that if it annoys creationists it, um, vastly, then well, we're doing our job because that's what that's what we're here for, and it's not to do so uh, just out of um, um, viciousness, but because it matters. Because these people can become Congress people. We've got you know, Mark Meadows, who was uh, Donald Trump's uh, um, chief of staff at the tail end of his administration. He's a young Earth creationist in the Ken Ham mode. That these people actually have an impact because they're influencing how laws are made and the like. And, and their method is so appallingly bad that you think that doesn't spill over into the other decisions. Lisa says she has um, uh, uh, she's reading Evolution Slam Dunk now, which is one I did solo on the reptile mammal transition. I'm very proud of that little puppy too, in that it gets you up to speed on what I regard as the slam dunk of macroevolution. That I'm I'm perfectly happy to discuss, and we do uh, discuss uh, the the bird dinosaur connection at, at length in the rocks were there, and we will be discussing the origin of tetrapods, whale evolution, human evolution, and all that in rocks were there volume two, uh, and we allude to. The reptile mammal transition example, citing back to boom, because uh, evolution slam dunk covers in great detail um, not only what the physical evidence is for the reptile mammal transition, but more precisely how anti evolution has completely screwed this up. And and it's not just well, some of them do. Excuse me, I went through all of them were available at the time and they range from the henry morris Dwayne ish era all the way through michael denton uh, I, I was just diving into his 2016 book uh evolution of uh, uh run oh uh, not evolution it's uh the um no, suddenly had a brain fart on um oh evolution a, a theory still in crisis that that's it yes that's, that's 2016 book where he skirted through the reptile mammal transition again and muddled it. Uh, and so it was uh, bringing all that up to speed because it's an area that it doesn't get discussed all that much. And because it doesn't get discussed all that much, it's not unknown in the scientific community. It just is mammals aren't as sexy. You look at therapsids and probanognathids, you know, they look like kind of mouses with and whiskers and things like that and you're going well yeah okay they're not neat like your big tyrannosaurs and all those funky dinosaurs and weird pterosaurs and all that it, 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 they don't have a lot of of um uh, panache but there are origins and unlike these other uh, macroevolutionary sequences they've got a very specific um traits that are acquired that if they were designed the designer was going out of their way to make fossils that match evolutionary predictions. It's that specific, and it all relates to the jaw ear thing. And you still find creationists. We're going to be alluding in the next book to some of the ones who have tried to criticize slam dunk and still trying to wave the um, uh, therapsid argument as if it helps their creationist case at all. Um, uh, Matt Powell had done some stuff on that, and there's a, a McLean, uh, who's a young Earth creationist and with an actual paleontology degree, um, who. Uh, gave a little side swipe at it in the video and all that. And we'll be alluding to all that uh, in the new book. Um, ooh, brain bug. You're name dropping. Arano uh, uh, chrysosporium in full spore. That sounds like a mushroom fungi thing. But you can let me know on the details on that because what else would you be describing spores in some other context? Maybe it's part of the alien invasion. At any rate, um, i got to remember to get at the other parts of the show. So I make sure I got all the uh, stuff on um, uh, Jensen. And uh, then part two, which I was going to have to fill out an entire show if necessary, uh, related to Frank Sherwin at Institute for Creation Research. He lobbed out an article at their ICR site on Austri osteostrakens aren't ancestors. For those of you not up on your fossil fish, uh, that's a part of the group that's in basal fish derivation groups, and, and we're talking about way long time ago. But Sherwin, uh, I'm gonna be, I'll be putting a link up to that. Um, Sherwin doesn't explain why they were around at all from a creationist perspective, and how could they be accounted for in the big slosh flood model? 
Yeah. So it's entirely an anti-evolution thing, not a here's why the creation model explains them at all uh, mode. And he all he did was dangle some authority quote snippets uh, largely from general books going in one case all the way back to Barbara Stahl from the 1980s, which I recognize her because I've discussed her um, uh, now and then in Slam Dunk. And also the various postings that I have at that website, uh, tortugan.wordpress.com. Um, Lisa says, "Can we call what they do research? Not really. It's it's gold mining. It's ammunition hunting, is what it is. Creationists hunt for ammo, and everything that isn't looking like they can use it for ammo, whoop, gone. And there's no attempt to try to deal with it, which is why cracking down the source material that." that the moment Jensen brings up that Ingman paper, every piece of information in it needs to be accounted for. Sorry, you're not doing it. And it's not explaining why anything else is doing it. Anyway, back to the Austria brackets. Um, he Sherwin discusses nothing on the paleontological or systematic work that he would need to supplant with a creation model. Meanwhile, the paleontologists didn't sit on their hands. So we've got uh, a 2015 paper by Robert Sansom et al. Uh, on the Royal Society uh, that goes into the area. There's a 2021 paper by Farron on their uh, phylogenetics of the stem nastosomes. And um, you can compare that level of detail with the fog bank that you're getting from Sherwin at the ICR. Now, the final link that I intended to put in there was the nod to Jackson Weed's appearance on Prophet of Zod's uh, deft deconstruction of Pastor Kevin, who sounds suspiciously like a Kent Hovindista. He's repeating a lot of the same tropes. I, I've gotten about halfway through it. Um, at the time, I had to shut down my main uh, computer uh, to get everything set up for today's show. Uh, so I actually hadn't got to the part that Jackson was involved with because he was bringing a, a discussion, I think, of amphibians. Um, in uh, his segment of the show. And um, because this pastor is repeating so many shrinking sun arguments, all of that, it's just terribly bad. It's nonsensical. Um, it, it deserved to be alluded to in uh, The Rocks Were There, Volume 2, on the cosmology section. Um, oh, uh, Br Brainbug says that the uh, aforementioned Fungi is a violet, bright violet crust fungus. Well, there you go. For all you bright violet crust fungi fans, that's the one that's your go-to for the day. Uh, he will make you all terribly happy. Fortunately, there's more than enough fungi to go around. They're indestructible for all practical purposes. They've been around for a couple billion years. Um, they're, uh, they have way more active and weird sex lives than we do. And apparently are functionally extinction-proof. Uh, so um, uh, they're going to be around long after we have checked out as a species, which we may eventually do. Anyway, uh, a little nod about some of the really stupid aspects of this um, Kevin video is that not only does Pastor Kevin rely on stupid argument, he doesn't even understand what the stupid argument means. That the argument has to do, one of the bits that he brought up has to do with what uh, could be called the, um, uh, the leap second issue, which is every once in a while, because our atomic clocks have gotten so accurate that the normal calendrical system that is not nearly as accurate as atomic clocks has to be tweaked like every second or so one way or the other to get it into sync again with the atomic clocks. That's all that's happening. It's not changing. How the Earth is suddenly not going having a little glitch. Although the speed of the Earth does change its rotation, just as the moon does, as its tidal locking moves it away, which it's been doing now for billions of years. Now, the argument that your Kent Hovind style people do is that if you extrapolate back, then the moon would be really close to the Earth and, uh, and it couldn't possibly be billions of years old and the Earth would be spinning so fast to be flying off into space and all, they make all sorts of weird extrapolations from this. But stupid Kevin goes one step further misunderstanding what the physics is by insisting that if the earth were spinning so fast we would be quote 
speed it up, you're a bunch of blobs squished into the earth. Gravity pull would be so great, you'd be mush. You wouldn't be here. There would be no sustainable life. No. <laughs> that at most, there would be a slight increase in centrifugal force if the earth was spinning in only a few hours, but not nearly enough even to fling you into space. And it would have no effect at all on the strength of gravity. And it would not be causing you to be mushed down as if gravity had changed. Does this guy not know the difference between the force of gravity and centrifugal force and all of that? Does he think that if he gets on the carousel and it starts speeding up real quickly, that he's going to implode into a black hole because of the increase of gravity? I don't know what he would be thinking about. Don't go on a carousel, Kevin. Uh, that's probably not a good idea for it. Uh, so it was a, um, a, a perfect example of how a modern, silly, YouTuber um, records their little spiel in front of the flock, never bothers to fact check a damn thing, and he keeps repeating, oh, that this is all the science. This is the real science See, he's giving people. No. And Zod, rather rightly, in the part that I had seen up to, which was about 20 some odd minutes into it, uh, rightly wonders what's going on with the people he's preaching to, that they have helped enable him by never challenging his viewpoints, never uh, arguing, never fact-checking with him, because their easy acceptance of the claptrap that they're being fed only encourages him. And apparently what happened was that uh, this Kevin guy got in a discussion group in which Zod was involved, and in, in, in another person at least, and completely misunderstood the context of it. Apparently the idea of somebody pushing back and saying, excuse me, but you're not telling science, just drove him ballistic. And Kevin was, was complaining that they were calling him dumb and stupid and that. And no, those terms actually hadn't come up. And he completely misunderstood all that. So uh, Zod was contending that uh, um, Pastor Kevin was actually misrepresenting the content of the discussion that he was alluding to, where he was just making up both ends of the conversation, which in the way preachers often do at that kind of, of, of apologetic level, makes perfect sense in terms of how they're ginning up the energy thing and putting themselves as the agreed party and all of that. But the problem was it wasn't matching up with the facts. So it's uh, it's quite a, uh, a fascinating bit. And we've got a big sidelong going on there about the fungi brain, brain and, and uh, BJ and Brian. You're, you're all fungi groupies. I can see it. And brain bug says you also, they also learned about Mississippi and shale. Yeah. The, um, any areas where you get out into the big world and start looking at the real estate, um, you can ask yourself, if you're a young earth creationist or not, how did this get to be the way it is? Why is this land where it is? If you are a believer in a, the big slosh flood, look down when you're outside and look at the ground around you and ask, could this have been caused by a flood? Can this be dated to a flood only 4,500 years ago? Is there anything here more than that? And start looking into the geology. And you will discover that odds are, most unless you live in the Grand Canyon or the Lewis Overthrust or some of the uh, um, uh, tiny snippets, the Morrison Formation, the creationist literature, um, most of the places aren't dealt with. Uh, Michael Ord, the creationist, uh, did a long book. Which is available online, by the way. I can't remember the title of it offhand. <clears throat> but it's a long compendium of his assertions about the flood layers. And basically, it's a series of largely dated, very sparsely documented bits and occasional pictures where essentially he's saying, this is the flood, this is the flood, this is the flood, this is the flood not showing that it actually is the flood and documenting it to that level. Um, you pick any area that you live at. I happen to live in Spokane, Washington, which is on the uh, Columbia Basalt. As it turns out, on the edge of what used to be the west coast of the North American continent like 300 million years ago, and that all of the real estate that I have driven back and forth through to get to Seattle to visit my relatives there, over the many years has a really interesting geological bits and pieces of ancient 
um, uh, exotic terrain that were out in the Pacific Ocean at one point and have gotten glommed into and slammed and morphed and rearranged. And then, of course, the vast amounts of the uh, uh, Columbia basalt, which is dwarfed by some of these gigantic, even bigger um, um, uh, plutonic uh, volcanic activity that was going out, out in seamounts, bits and pieces of it, like Silesia, that's gotten slammed into all this. Nick Zentner, the geologist at Central Washington University, um, is uh, has been going into great detail on this in his, in his various college lecture material, and it's all available online and stuff. And don't worry, you won't have to go hunting for it. It's all going to be in the references in the rocks where there. There's going to be a whole info box on a summarization of the intricate geology of the Pacific Northwest. And the one thing I can say about it, where the hell is the flood in all of this? None of it makes sense in terms of a compressed chronology. And there has been virtually nothing on the creationist side to even deal with it. The closest they get is to veer slightly into the Columbia basalt issue and slightly into the Missoula floods. And we alluded to that in volume one of the rocks were there. We had a whole section on, on, on that uh, matter. And that was just the tip of the iceberg because the, the detailed paleogeology that's been going on in this field just in the last five years is such that as I was seeing the cutting edge stuff that you are seeing at the college level discussion, which is what Nick Zentner is doing, you're catching up with all of that material and seeing the doors opening up on the new breed of geologists and what they're doing. And boy, that's so far ahead of the creationist, it hurts. They, they, they haven't even caught up to 1980 geology, let alone uh, 2020. And so it's going to be um, um, a nice little info box section in the new book because of, of the gauntlet that we'll be throwing down in relation to all the stuff that just doesn't make sense from the creationist model. And this is independent. We're not in the Grand Canyon area. This is a completely different area. And some of this stuff is actually going on the tail. Most of this is taking place before the Grand Canyon even exists, if you look at it chronologically. And some of the stuff is going back hundreds of millions of years and other material. There's a window that's mainly in like the 50, 60 million year ago range for an awful lot of busy stuff that's going on. And they, they can track the, the fault lines and the slip faults and all the interesting stuff that's going on in there at, at remarkable length and detail. And it's absolutely fascinating. Okay, I'm losing you all, kids. You're all going off on the uh, on the fun guy. Uh, so we're uh, uh, almost near to the end of the hour. Does anyone have any non-fungus related questions uh, to offer the old RJ there um, from Beach or uh, Brain? Uh, I'll say that Jackson did a really splendid job on the um, uh, fungus discussion that I was in part um, kind of hanging on uh, because I know nearly as much about it as he does um, it, on uh, Lamont's channel um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, doo, 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 doo. Yeah, we still got the uh, uh, black witch's butter, though. No, yeah, we're we're on the we're on the fungi here. I lost you kids. I lost you kids. Oh my. Um, so apparently no questions on the, um, the topics at hand. Naturally, once the um, uh, signal feeds uh, conclude and the show finalizes and all that, then I'll go back in and put in uh, the links to uh, all the fun and games uh, that I've been alluding to. Oh, Hip Hop Autonomous, 40 days of rain is not enough to flood the whole world? <laughs> and Lisa asked, uh, uh, wouldn't the earth be too hot for us because of all that pressure? Um, the pressure isn't really the problem that's for heat. The, the, there are multiple areas that relate to the heat issue, uh, Lisa. One is just trying to cram all the geology into a short period of time. So all the tectonic activities that are taking place over millions of years now have to take place over like months, days. And um, that's a problem. The other has to do with all the impact events that would all have to be taking, of which we've got going back all through the geologic column. There are massive super craters and things that happen, most of which we're seeing heavily eroded because they're really old and things have changed. So there's the stuff, the Precambrian impact, where you just see the traces of them. The Chichalub is buried under masses of sediment in Yucatan. It's not on the surface. It's all done by seismic things. And it was discovered by petroleum geologists who studied that area because of the potential oil reserves uh, in there. And so they're encountering this big concentric rings 
of the gigantic impact crater uh, that's all done seismically. All of that crunched together is more heat. And then there's the issue which many creationists have to reject for this very reason, which is accelerated radioactive decay, which we discussed in quite a bit of detail in the rocks were there, where we talked about, we're not talking a toasty afternoon. Oh my, all that accelerated radioactive decay, I better make myself a mint julep and sit on the veranda until it goes away. No, we're talking about millions of degrees hotter than the sun, turning the entire planet into plasma heat. This is, this is serious heat. <laughs> Needless to say, an awful lot of creationists go, and realize they can't possibly accommodate that level. So they've got to give up on cell radio radioactive decay. Meanwhile, the ones who still push it need it because they've got to eliminate the radioactive clock. They've got to get decay chains from one element to another, which is what happens in radioactivity. They got to speed that up. Otherwise, they've got stuff that's going on over millions of years. So it, they're forced into this box and they're into an absolute mess. Um, and, oh, brain bug, sorry, you're not sorry you derailed the topic. No, you aren't, be honest. You got off on your fungi things. Uh, let's see, um, oh, I gotta back up to some of the um, questions in here because they did actually start coming out, come on. There we go. Oh, I did that, there we go. Uh, how on earth does the water come out of the deep in giant springs? That's another funky one. Because, first of all, yeah, I'll give you a brief history of young earth creationism. Because if you read back in 1970s young earth creationism, the Henry Moore's Dwayne Gish era, when Jerry Falwell was running the back, they seriously imagined that the earth looked pretty much like it does now. That there's North America, South America, there's continents spread apart, there's Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean and all that. And the flood takes place in that environment. No paleo continents. They were denying continental drift completely. Eventually, it dawns on people that Mount Everest is really higher than Mount Ararat. In fact, there's an awful lot of mountains that are taller than Mount Ararat. And if all the world is covered, then either they got to go way up to the Mount Everest level, and that's a volume of water that's too big to get anywhere, or yeah, the continental distributions are different. So in the 80s and 90s, they were basically whittling down. They're taking out their little sander set and pulling down all of those higher mountains so Ararat can be at the top. That solves some of the problem because it reduces the amount of water needed. But still, what happened to it next? So the argument that you get today as they've had to mutate and shift along to where they've incorporated the continental drift that they denied 20 years ago, is that there was a different distribution, maybe like Rodinia, maybe like Pangea, depends on the creationists you read. Don't ask us about too many details now. That's not what they do. And the mountain ranges didn't exist yet, other than the little Ararat, and everything was benign, and maybe there was like, like vapor canopies or something or other. We were still flirting a little bit with that. It pops up every once in a while. And floating forests, maybe or maybe not. And accelerated plate tectonics, maybe or maybe not, depending on which creationist you read. And there's huge back and forths going on, this stuff buried in the notes in their technical literature, if you start looking. And we've alluded to chunks of that in the rocks for there. But that there's all this hypothetical water in the fountains of the deep. We know there's lots of water that's trapped in, in various ways down in the, in the thing, but it's not like a sponge that if you go, you get squirt. They've kind of got to imagine the rock functions that way, which is geologically Looney Tunes. But let's give them that for the sake of argument that somehow or other, and they sh when you see the movies and things they do on there, these vast sprays of water like the Bellagio fountains on steroids coming up all over the planet and sloshing out. Theoretically, if you just arbitrarily assume these gigantic things are there and the water is spewing up, you can calculate to get enough water that can fill up. And then, of course, there's the water above the firmament. What the hell is that? What is there, a layer of lakes up there? They're not too clear about that either. That's where some of them drag in your vapor canopies, your ice, a Hovian theory, Kent Hovian still dangles with, which is kind of like space snowballs. Uh, up there that come down and, and, and splash and produce things like that. It, it's, 
if you're expecting great detail out of their arguments, you're in the wrong field. No, that ain't going to work. Um, but what they end up with, these scenarios all have an end game, which is after the water is splashed out and come down from the firmament, and it then trickles away and goes wherever it goes, like into the places where the firm water was down below, these caverns that have collapsed and all that kind of stuff. Again, not terribly detailed. But the end result is the oceans we know now are the leftover of the water of the flood. That's pretty much kind of where all their arguments are trending. So all of their dynamics are backloaded so that they arrive at the current arrangement of the continents and the water. And then everything has to plow back on that. That's the, the situation where they are now. Now, this is still cartoon level. Read through Answers in Genesis and ICR and, uh, and for laughs, go over to the Kent Hogan style preachers to get some sense of just how cartoon this is. And I don't have to make this up. Uh, Andrew Snelling. Uh, is at that cartoon level. If you see his recent postings from like 2015 and all that, where they try to give a sense of what the pre-flood lo world looked like, it's a cartoon. The map of Middle Earth is more detailed in the Lord of the Rings with mountain ranges and rivers and forests and cities and roadways all noted in great detail. Samaria in the Conan stories that are done, uh, that, that were made into a movie with Schwarzenegger and then more recently. That, there's maps in the Conan novels of the Sumerian Hyperborean Age, it was called, uh, all fictional stuff. That's more detailed than what you're getting in the cartoon versions uh, of creations. Then you go read the technical science literature and you discover what the modern geologists are doing with their detailed plate boundaries and working out where fault lines are and doing all the little stuff and working out paleo drainage patterns of, of rivers and therefore figuring out where mountain ranges were and blah, blah, blah. It's so far ahead of what's being done by even their geologists, Snelling and Clary and all the rest, that it's just ludicrous. So... Um, uh, Lisa Virtue, I'm still waiting for his old earth debunk from the Grand Canyon. Uh, what will uh, brain bug? The ice of the firmament was used to deal with the heat problem. That's part of their trick. Yeah, they try to have their cake, not only try to have their cake and eat it, but they want somebody else to bake it. That they've simultaneously got a bunch of saves that they come up with. Uh, so another one is that somehow or other the heat is being dissipated by some quantum process, maybe in space, somehow or other, uh, Jason Lyle and that crowd uh, uh, delve into some of that kind of arguments. And it's very ad hoc. And it hasn't even persuaded their fellow creationists. That, I think, is the serious issue. It hasn't gotten even onto the scope of being a viable alternative for the regular cosmological view. And uh, to the extent that they try to do that, the cosmologists kind of go, Okay, let's go get some coffee. This is absurd. <laughs> oh, Brian, Brian the Hyperborean uh, uh, age or the age of metal album coverage. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, I'm not sure it's the hyper, Hyperborean. I think it maybe is the Hyborian age, something like um, something like that, if I remember. Um, you can find it if you, if you get, I have all the old Conan novels and that in, in my um fiction collection downstairs, and, and I think every one of them had as an appendix at the end of it, the little maps of um, the Sumerian world, because you need to know where um, the various kingdoms and stuff were. Um, uh, BJ says, a pity the Bible doesn't explain all this in minute details, but I guess the audience at the time was appealed to instead. Well, it's hard to give details when you don't know what they are. And to be fair, the people writing the Bible weren't trying to explain stuff in detail. They were just trying to fit together things. And all the scholarship suggests that the Bible people didn't have a direct experience of any of these big Sumerian floods. They picked it up secondhand and incorporated it along with the various mythic lore from the Babylonians and to some extent the Egyptians and probably some of the other cultures that didn't leave written accounts that we can cross compare with them uh, to make up stuff. Uh, Brain bug didn't even spell it. Oh, I, it's, I'm just going by memory on it, but I seem to think it, it's, it's got more B's and I don't think it has a B in there. 
But that term hyperborea and that connects up with a whole bunch of weird lore of um Thule and weird stuff going on in mythic lore that connects up with the Valkyries and Scandinavian mythology and all of that stuff. I mean, you you can get into rabbit holes of terminology there. And when somebody like Robert E. Howard is coming along to make up a mythic era age, and remember he's doing his writing actually before Tolkien is inventing Middle Earth. Um, uh, Tolkien is doing his stuff in the um, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and Lord of the Rings doesn't come out until 1965. So the, a lot of the stuff um, in Lord of the Rings hadn't been crystallized when he did uh, The Hobbit back in I think, the 1930s, just before the Second World War. Whereas by that time, already Robert E. Howard was running gangbusters in here, and Howard really is paying more homage to the Edgar Rice Burroughs tradition of Pellucidar and all of the, you know, he's also the creator of Tarzan, John Carter of Myers, all of these fantastical places that they would go to. And that writing is in the period before World War One and after World War One. So that's even earlier than, than Howard was. So there's a long tradition of making up fast and fabulous eras and creations in all of this. What we can see is that the tales that we're getting in most of the religion books are not nearly that anal retentive. They're not that concerned about all the fiddly bit details. Hip hop asks, can microevolution account for the claim of only kinds being on the ark? Um, and um, and what does genetics have to say about this? Ah, the the, the nebulous kinds. Um, microevolution, if the, in order to limit the, uh, I mentioned this in, the, in, I think last week, and I'll give you a little short reprise of it this time. If you didn't have to worry about the damned flood, you would have had no problem creating whatever level of kinds you want. And if the only problem would be if you had to have them all at once. So Old Earth creationists have no difficulty. They can theoretically accept kinds in a vague sense, and it can be every species if they feel like it. It's not a problem because they can they can go as far um, at, at whoop, long bloody little thing. I get an arrow down here, and then um, yeah, whoop. an arrow pops up that shows more messages. And when I hit on that, suddenly I get the thing up on the screen. Uh, Howard is, was a weird idea of race too. He was a buddy of Lovecraft. Yeah, that, that connects up with a whole bunch of other interlocks of what was going on. In uh, there's an occult motif that, and magical, weird snake creatures and stuff that pop up in the, the Howard novel far more so than in the somewhat more Roman Catholic y uh, tidied up version that you get in the mythology that you get in Lord of the Rings. Anyway, we digress again. Um, where was I? I was talking about the um, uh, um, the flood water and microevolution in the flood. If all you have is kinds being made over time, you don't have a problem there either. If you try to have them all happening at once, you have to deal with why we aren't seeing a fossil record of that. We're seeing a transformation of time, reptile metal transition. So there's a difficulty. But the creation flood model adds another problem because of the bloody arc. Because now you not only have to have the fixed kinds made at the beginning of the creation week and only once, then you've got to go through all of the fossil record that's diversifying from those kinds. And then those same kinds have to be put on the ark, which has a limited booking capacity. And that's why creationists, the more they had to think through how many kinds can we cram on the ark, Realize that the numbers that were being bandied about by some theoreticians, 50, 80,000, that's too big. So when you get down to the Ark Encounter, Ken Ham's big barge down there in Kentucky, um, you now have it trimmed back to only 1,500 kinds. So now you can fit them on the Ark. And don't ask about the insects or the fish or nematodes or any of these others. We don't think about them. So they got the animal kinds on board the ark. Already, they've they're confronting a problem, and that is you've got fossil record from the kinds, and then the existing species from the same kinds. Holy moly, have you got a lot of speciation going on, and really, really, really fast. 
Andrew Snelling has mastodons appearing after the Tower of Babel and going extinct almost immediately, apparently. Holy moly, this is ridiculous. So we're talking about way more than microevolution. The hyperspeciation that creationists are coming to require in their flood models resolve one problem and cause the other because they require a speciation rate so fast that no microevolution can account for it. Functionally, you're seeing macroevolutionary speciation. The very thing that the flood model was intended to get away from to have these nice, tidy five kinds. Creationists have evolved spectacularly. Uh, how do they survive the termites? Ah, there you go, Lisa. Those pesky little bugs. And the gut microbia in the termites that require allow them to eat wood. Maybe they had a special stuff that made the wood, uh, uh, prevented it from being a termite, uh, uh, made it termite resistant. And this was unfortunately not patented because Noah was on a drunken bender and forgot to do that after the flood. So there you go. There's the, the, the problem of demon rum. Anyway. Um, so what you then got is creationists functionally accepting levels of evolution that they would reject only a few years ago. And the, we allude to a bunch of that in the uh, Barominology chapter of um, uh, the rocks are there about um, the giraffes that are evolving from short neck forms exactly in the way that Dwayne Gish was saying was impossible 25 years ago. And the horses coming from Dinohippus, the horse ancestor, not an equus in the ark, it's Dinohippus. And maybe even the Pacacetids developing into oceanic whales after the ark. They're kind of vague on that one. You're not too clear on that. We'll be alluding to all of that fuss and games in the whale chapter, whale evolution section of the new rocks for their volume two. So, uh, oh. Um, the that one there is the rocks were there. That's the one I wrote with Jackson Wheat. Link in the, the thing as always. Next to it is Evolution Slam Dunk, which is the book on the reptile mammal transition. And the only other book involved is the Paralogues of Phileas Fogg, my mystery science adventure retelling of around the world in 80 days. And I'm nearing completion on the second volume in what is going to be a multi-series of really fun, I find ripping good yarn adventures of, of things involving what's in the box in Chicago and all the other fun games there. All the rest of what you see behind me are CDs and DVDs. So they're video and audio collection, they're not books. I have tons of books and they are uh, in the other rooms, they're downstairs in my libraries and the, and the den and all that, they're all over the house, but they're, they're not in here. So this is my audio video media room and shameless plug slot. Uh, for the various books. Um, yes, it couldn't, uh, BJ says, couldn't live in art that had centipede kind running around somewhere. This is one of the giant um, avoidance areas of all creationism is they just don't want to think about insects. And some creationists are freely admitting, especially ones that have some familiarity with insects, that there must have been insects on the ark, that some insects simply couldn't survive in the flood environment and had to have been kept on the ark. In details, they don't go into. Others just don't bother about it. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, there's the issue about freshwater versus saltwater fish and marine creatures surviving. That, that yeah, some have tolerance for various salinity factors, but not all. And so now they have to account for all that, and there's way too much to go on. Uh, brain bug, what are they going to do with two bees? You need a minimum of three bees. Now, if you're going to be pesky and require detailed explanations for all of this stuff, then we're in terrible trouble because that ain't ever going to happen. <laughs> that the, the, if you look at the creationist apologetics on any of these topics, what you see is what I describe in, in my work, and we continue with that in the uh, rocks where their work is be whiz it's look at the wonders of creation the insects can do all of these wonderful amazing things it must have been god's design see how wonderful this is be whiz and maybe if they get around to it oh this is a problem for godless evolutionists they cannot explain fill in the blank no footnote 
associated with it, or they cannot explain this based on my misrepresentation of this technical paper that we hope you don't read and find out that they're actually talking about stuff that's different from what I'm saying. That's what you tend to get in a lot of the apologetics at AIG and ICR, not a rigorous thinking through of, excuse me, but 20,000 species of ants? How many kinds are there? Generally speaking, the benchmark will be a kind is kind of like a family at the taxonomic level of family, below an order and above um, you're a genus. And um, that you've got, they're okay with most kinds being family level because that can keep the things down. You know, like maybe 20 families of dinosaurs known? Yeah, not too bad. They would all have to be on the ark and so forth and so on. It blows to smithereens when you start getting into others. There are 12 families of bats, or 20 families of bats alone. Just bats. How many bats are shown on the Ark encounter? Two. <laughs> Unidentified as to what they are. Uh, oddly enough, I suspect it may have had something to do with the fact that uh, Todd Wood only did baromenology analysis for two families of bats in his work back in 2008, which I think is the only stuff that's been done on it, allude to that in the baronology chapter of the rocks were there. And you find out, holy moly, is he living out, leaving out data, biogeographical material on where they live in South America, the cacti that are being pollinated by them, all of the different connections. Uh, how did, what, did the bats carry the cacti with them from the ark? I mean, what the hell's going on here? He doesn't think about that. Leaves out all the genetic data. Uh, in, in one of the family groups. I mean, it's just a mess. Uh, Brian Stevens likes the big, long-legged white ones. They could win a NASCAR race without trying to. Uh, some of the weird little um, uh, critters in that. Uh, Lisa produces, how did they survive all that methane? Oh, all of this is that, that if creationists try to think through what the big slosh entails at a this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, big at the time frame. They instantly bog down in the details. That they're stumbling over vast amounts of information that can't be crammed into the model, no matter how they make it fit. So what you see in their apologetics is them not looking at most of the data. So what scholarly people like me are up to is let's see where they're leaving it out. And that's why you need to be able to see the primary sources. That's what we did in the rocks where they are evolving the bats. To, to point out all that's being left out of the topics they bring up. And then there's all the topics they don't bring up. I measure overall that anti-evolutionism, not just young earth creationism, is missing about 90% of the data field. You can't build a model off of missing 90%. You can make a cartoon that will account kind of, sort of, for some of the 10%, but we've seen over and over again that they don't even manage that that the cartoon starts fraying at the edges, even with the very limited data field they bring up. And that this is just miles removed from the actual data set. So yeah, uh, BJ uh, loves the name, the big slosh, yeah. Uh, I wanted something, otherwise we'd be referring to global flood, global flood, global flood, global flood. Yeah, I want to shake it up a little bit. And that's ultimately what it is. It's the big slosh that you've got this, just think of, of, of carrying a fishbowl around with you and you put it on a paint shaker <laughs> and you pour a bunch of sand and stuff in there and expect it to do your little bare tall stratification and turn into rock and then some more water you spill in from a glass and you can carve a little teeny grand thing in there. Give that a try, kids. See if you can replicate that at your home experiment. Uh, we do not accept any responsibilities for broken glass, dead fish, and or screaming uh, relatives wondering, what the hell did you do in the bathroom? <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's uh, part of the argument. And, and if creationists were showing at any level that they could get better than that, no. In every single instance, they're misrepresenting the data field, misrepresenting the primary sources. So uh, everybody that wants to jump on this bandwagon of source analysis, you don't have to follow up everything, but 
mind bug is an insect person. Others are geology minded. Others are cosmology people. Others are paleontology. Others like existing species. Others like biogeography. Uh, there's a whole different interest that anybody could have. And you can follow up your area of interest. And if you apply source methods and discover, well, wait a minute, this is really misrepresenting the material. If you got camera, laptop, do some YouTubes like I do. This, this is a zero cost operation in the sense I, of, of beyond the expense of the laptop. And that I'm not paying for the, the restream. I'm not getting the expensive one that costs money. This is the free restream. And the same thing for all the other little things. This is low budget. If I can do it, absolutely uh, anything. Yeah, yeah, I, that's why I brought that up, uh, Lisa, the uh, sand toy. Uh, Ken Hoving, to this day, will often bring up, brings in the jar. Uh, I wish I could do as nearly a good as impression. Uh, um, Josh uh, Bowen does a hilarious, dead-on impression of Ken Hoving. And Erica... Is, is developing a uh, Erica. That's a given. Is, is developing a really good um, uh, impression as well. It, there's a certain intonation and twang to it that um, uh, I'm not nearly as adept with. But anyway, he would put up uh, uh, these things to show. See, it forms layers. Yeah, has any of it formed rock? You need it to be rock. You need it to be rock in a hurry because it needs to be rock in like a year. Otherwise. You can't have that hypothetical non-existent water slide coming in from the non-existent lake burrowing out the canyon in a way that, that floods don't do. No, it's 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 an absolute mess. So anyway, um, uh, we're, um, oh, heaven, I've spilled halfway into the hour on there. Um, thank you, everyone, as uh, for uh, joining the show and, and the fungi interlude that went on in the, in the live chat as well. The, the fungi are really quite an intriguing phylum and vastly diverse. Uh, and it's been in recent years that they've been able to do more and more genetic studies in any area where there are so many species and groups involved. It's a daunting task in the same way ants, uh, you know, they still don't know what the hell the pygidial gland does. And that's its defining taxonomic character. <laughs> they literally don't know what any of it does on 20,000 species of ants. So um, uh, there's a lot of science work still being done, virtually none of which will be being done by creationists, and most of it will be ignored by creationists. So any of the science areas you dive into are already a leg up on the creationists. So thank you, everyone, for showing up. Uh, um, I'll, I'll find out what uh, Jackson's difficulty was. He may have had a last-minute thing where he had to work at the store. That, uh, that uh, occasionally happens with him. I shut down from Twitter. Uh, before I actually uh, start up the thing, so I have as little going on the laptop as possible to make sure we don't have an interrupted stream, uh, and we didn't. So um, we'll find out what the circumstance. I do hope you, everything is all right. With, uh, with Jack. Strange things can happen in the real world. Stay safe, everybody. If you are not vaccinated, get vaccinated. There's no more to be done on that. Um, uh, don't accept any wooden penguins. Uh, we're wanting to get back into normal things to where we can uh, sail stupid creationists face to face without masks. And they can see the the contempt on our sneering faces as we dump technical information. So, um, uh, see you all next week, and everybody stay safe and fine. Um, 